everyone, and thank you all for joining us. Today we have the privilege of hosting four very special panelists no. for a discussion on the Law Commission's 2018 report on reforming the Land Registration Act 2002. Before we begin, we'd like to extend our deepest thanks to our speaker series sponsor, Give a Chance. Give a Chance to name number one law firm in the Chamber's global top 30, the <laughs> second year running, and value their relationship with the Cambridge Law Society to secure some of the best and brightest future lawyers for the firm. Give a Chance, an opportunity for students from first year onwards. And you can find out more by visiting their website or stay up to date by following them on Twitter at CC Grads UK. <laughs> on our panel, we have Professor Nicholas Hopkins, Law Commissioner for Property, Family and Trust Law. We also have Judge Elizabeth Cook, Principal Judge of the First Tier Tribunal, Property Chamber Land Registration Division. We also have, as you'd be familiar with, Professor Martin Dixon, Professor of the Law of Real Property and Fellow of Queen's College, Cambridge. And moderating, we have Ms. Amy Goymore, Professor, sorry, University <laughs> Lecturer in Land Law and Fellow of Downing College, Cambridge. The Q&A will be in four parts, with an exploration of adverse possession, priority disputes, rectification, and indemnities. Without further ado, please join me in welcoming our panel. So just so that you know the format, we're planning on this being an hour-long session, and we've broadly divided the topics up into time periods. Mick is going to present on each of the topics to begin with, just to say a bit about the Law Commission's findings and recommendations, and then we'll see what Lizzie and Martin have to say about these proposals, and then it is genuinely up to you with whatever questions you want to ask. Hopefully related to the topic. <laughs> so over to you. Thank you. And thank you uh, very much for putting this event on. I'm absolutely delighted to be here to tell you a bit about the work uh, that we have published. Um, I'm going to try and keep what I say uh, very brief, so I apologise in advance. There's a lot on the slides that I don't actually mention, because if I did, there wouldn't be much time um, for Lizzie and Martin uh, to, uh, uh, to, to, to respond. So adverse possession, first of all, um, and as I'm sure you're aware, in unregistered land, we have the idea that title is obtained through possession. So if you stay in adverse possession for uh, 12 years, you extinguish the superior title uh, and you acquire title by possession. The 1925 Land Registration Act sort of did something analogous but it couldn't extinguish the title as long as the, uh, the uh, title was registered. So instead it imposed a trust after 12 years and then the adverse possessor could apply uh, to be registered as, as the uh, proprietor. The 2002 Act made quite a radical change to that and the Act puts forward the idea that title is only obtained through possession, sorry, only obtained through registration, <coughs> not possession. So after 10 years, you can apply as an adverse possessor to become the registered proprietor. And you only obtain title if you're successful in making that application under Schedule 6. We didn't reopen that basic policy decision of the 2002 Act. So we didn't uh, go back to the idea of the question of whether title should be obtained purely through possession uh, or whether Schedule 6 was necessary. Um, and equally, we took the view that there was no point in trying to rewrite Schedule 6. It was written from a, a blank piece of paper. We've got quite a lot of experience of where the pressure points are within the procedure. And so what we decided to do was address specific issues that had arisen with the schedule, and also consider how Schedule 6 interacts with the general law of adverse possession. And that, that's relevant as well to something I'll say about priorities, about the approach we, we took to land registration. In terms of the Schedule 6 procedure, I think that the most significant proposal we have relates to Zarb and Parry. So after 10 years, you can apply to become the registered proprietor. If the registered proprietor objects, your application is rejected unless you fulfil one of three conditions in Schedule 5. One of those relates to 
boundary disputes, essentially, that if you are the proprietor of adjoining land and you reasonably believe that the land you were in adverse possession of was yours, then you can obtain registration under one of the conditions in paragraph 5. What Zabon Pali brought to light was a, an uncertainty about the relationship between your reasonable belief and the timing of your application. So, do you have to apply as soon as you cease to have reasonable belief? Can you apply as long as you have reasonable belief at any time for 10 years, even if that was several years before you make your application, or, or what? And in Zabon Pali, we were told that you have to reply, that you have to apply quite soon after your reasonable belief comes to an end. We thought the general approach to Zabon Pali was the right one, but that it was leaving things a little bit too vague um, to say quite soon or shortly after the belief comes to an end. So we decided to put a time limit on that of 12 months. We didn't like either the other possibilities. We thought to require an immediate application was simply not realistic, because it's usually the fact your reasonable belief comes to an end that makes you think about investigating the title. But also, we didn't think that you should be able to apply any time and say, well, 12 years ago, for 10 years, I had a reasonable belief. And that's because we took the view that there is a general policy in settling these boundary disputes, and if they're not settled, the chances are they will simply come back. So I'm going to pause there. Judge Cook. Oh, God, it's me. Yeah. <laughs> okay, I'm going to say something really unfashionable, which is that I really like adverse possession. I like it because it keeps the ownership of land in tune with the people who are losing it, using it. Land is a very, very scarce resource, and adverse possession responds to the need to keep it in possession, to keep it used. So, sadly, I, I, would, I would scrap Schedule 6. I would go back to pre-2002. I know that option's been ruled out, so there we go. Um, one of the virtues of adverse possession is that it sorts things out without litigation. So if your land registry plan says your boundary is there, and if your fence is there, in unregistered land, if, it's, you know, if your deeds say the boundary is there and your fence is there, if your land is unregistered and you realise there's a problem, you know that after 12 years, the law of adverse possession will put your boundary where the fence is. Nobody needs to sue anybody. It's just there. And the law of adverse possession has just sorted it all out and there's no confrontation. And that is even more useful than the general idea that you need to keep land in use. So my biggest sadness about the 2002 Act is Schedule 6. And within Schedule 6, my biggest sadness is that the saving for boundaries depends upon reasonable belief. Now, even though, you have to forgive me if I ramble on, but this is the one on which I'm going to have my biggest rant. <laughs> even though the Land Registration Act was intended to make registered title squatter proof, I spend an awful lot of my time as a property law judge dealing with adverse possession disputes. It hasn't made it go away. It's just changed the shape of how adverse possession is addressed in litigation. Largely, it's addressed through the reasonable belief about a boundary exception. And unfortunately, that means that I have to take the lid off people's heads, look inside and say, was there a belief in there? And was it reasonable? And you can't just ask people, did you believe? Because, of course, people lie. They don't mean to lie. They believe they're speaking the truth. But people change their perceptions under pressure. And so, yeah, of course, I always believed it was mine. And, and, and doubts get pushed out under the pressure to meet the statutory condition. So I, I am really sad about Schedule 6. Zom Parry um, 
refines it a little. Um, I mean, this is the one where Nick and I probably are <laughs> at variance. We are best of friends, but I don't <laughs> like about 12 months. Um, it's very, very difficult for anybody to think, oh, do you know, I don't believe that's my land anymore. But it doesn't stop like that. Well, think, think about things on which you've changed your mind. How do you know when you stop believing something? And even harder, how do you know when you stopped reasonably believing? Oh God, I'm being unreasonable now, aren't I? <sighs> so, I'm, I'm not a happy bunny on, on Schedule 6, sadly. Can I, can I pray to you further before Ooh. we hand over to Martin? When you say one of the biggest attributes of adverse possession is to settle boundary disputes without having to go to litigation. Are you a fan of adverse possession in the broader context, where a squatter goes onto a piece of land that's nowhere near to his own land? <clears throat> a pie, sort of, oh not much a pie case, but or, you know, or taking over near, house. Or, or near his own land, but not a boundary. It's yes. an extra field. Yes. That is less easy to defend than boundary adverse possession, but I do still like it because it keeps land in use. Mm -hmm. And I think if somebody so doesn't care about land on this small island, but they haven't looked at it for 12 years, I, I don't feel a huge amount of sympathy for them. Can I probe a different way? Yes. <coughs> Which is where the general boundaries rule fits within this. Because if it's a general mm. boundary, the uh, th thinking in terms of being able to resolve boundary disputes without litigation, if it's a general boundary, you don't really need litigation because you can look at it and say, well, it, it's, it, it's part of the general boundary, and so the, the title doesn't have to be changed, there doesn't have to be a, an adverse possession claim. So, so I wonder. That, sorry. No, <laughs> that, so I wonder if thinking about that condition in Schedule Five as being no, no, I, no I'm guilty. I introduced it as being concerned with boundaries. If it's not really concerned with boundaries, it's more concerned with the adjoining piece of land, which is sufficiently significant that it doesn't come within the general boundaries rule. Sadly, um, your litigant in the on the Clapham omnibus does not understand about general boundaries. Most of the boundary disputes that we deal with in the context of adverse possession are about inches, not feet. I went to a site visit this morning, which was a boundary dispute where the dispute is about the thickness of a brick wall. So the dispute is a brick long. And it really matters to these people. It is no good by saying to them, oh, that's within your general boundary, which mm. it manifestly is, because Mrs. Thing over here wants to know whether she can put plants on top of the wall, and Mr. Thing over here is determined that she shall not, and is determined <laughs> that she shall not let ivy grow on the fence. <laughs> and this huge, there's no way that anybody mm. can say to them, oh, it's just your general boundary. Um, he, it, is, it is the real people who frame the dispute. And I don't have jurisdiction to say to them, off you go, it's a general boundary, because the law also says that they have a real boundary. It is the law that there is a boundary, and it's hair thin, and it is a line. And where people decide that they actually want to know where that is, they are entitled to discover where it is, and, and general boundaries, sadly, is not an answer. It is for the reasonable person, it is not for the people in the dispute, because people in dispute are not reasonable. Professor Dixon, do you have any uh, Not news? really, I mean, I agree with every word Lizzie has said, really. Um, <laughs> <laughs> they I do think... co-author a book. <laughs> <laughs> I, think, I think the, the attempt to abolish adverse possession it, in relation to registered title had nothing to do with making registered title safer, more guaranteed. It, it was an ethical, political decision. Perfectly reasonable to take that, but I, I object to the pretense that it has anything to do with security of registered title. I object to that very much. 
Um, abolish it, if you will, but don't lie about it, is how I feel about it. Uh, uh, so having said that, having said that, uh, I mean, you know, I, I don't like the introduction of reasonable belief the same as Professor Cook, because I, I just think it introduces, uh, and please take this the right way, I don't quite mean it like this, but a near moral element into yes. this, and I don't like yeah. it, because that's not what adverse reaction does. No, I agree. And, and so I, I you know. Did you consider removing the reasonable belief requirement as a part of your it, remit? It, it certainly came up in the, the consultation responses we had. Mm -hmm. um, we felt it did serve a purpose. And of course, the reasonableness is, is something that lawyers use a lot in lots of different contexts. Mm -hmm. And I think we took the view that if there was going to be a limitation on, no pun intended, a limitation on the ability to claim <laughs> adverse possession, then reasonable belief was as good as any that, that we could possibly replace it with. And of course, adverse possession, you, you have to look at intention to possess. So you're, mm. you're already lifting up the head and peering into it. Oh, but you do it, you do it objectively. Reasonable? I think that, well, the objectivity of the animus occidentae is well established. Um, what has he done? Does it look as if he needs to be there? Mm. Uh, and, and that's not too difficult because you're looking at a fence or whatever it is. Um, I don't know how to translate that to reasonable belief. Um, you know, given the evidence he had, well, was he reasonable? Well, it was on his side of the fence. Yeah, I mean, I, I, I just think that, that the legislation wants it both ways. If you don't want adverse possession, just get rid of yeah. it. Then. Just get rid of it. Don't, 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 don't say it serves a useful purpose, except when we don't want it to. Because it hasn't got rid of any boundary, any no. adverse no. possession disputes. It's just changed the terms in which they're framed. So it hasn't worked. No. Mindful of time, and we've got four topics to, to discuss. <laughs> Does anybody have any questions to put to the panel? Yes. Speak up so that the microphone can hear you as well. Oh, right. Yeah, it's just a question for um, Professor Lisa. I just wanted to, um, I just wanted to understand, you said uh, I don't like reasonable belief because it incorporates a moral element in adverse possession. Is that because you think adverse possession shouldn't have anything to do with you know, wider moral concerns or social factors or anything like that, do you I, think it should only be in regards to boundaries? No, I just think adverse possession is about the reality of who's using the land. And I think that's what it's about. And I don't think it's for other people to say, you shouldn't be doing that. And the reasonable belief is, what's reasonable to me isn't reasonable to you. He's a liar, she's a liar, is what you're going to get. It shouldn't be about who deserves to have yeah, the land. Yeah, it shouldn't be about that's who deserves it. Any other questions on adverse possession? Yes. Um, I know some people argue that the narrowing of the, of the categories in which the slaughter can be seen to almost encourage them to move outside the system to like something Who are you directing your question at? I think I, I didn't quite this. catch the last few words. Yeah. Encourages? Um, encourages squatters to kind of move outside the system and not um, and avoid this. Oh, that was that article, wasn't yeah. it? Yeah, yeah. the Lorna yeah. Cook and... Lorna. Um, yeah. I have to... If, if you're thinking of the article in the conveyance a little while ago, I have to express some disagreement with that. I don't think... I don't believe that um, <coughs> squatter's title is being traded. No, I don't know. I don't think for a moment that, any, that there is a market in unregistered squatter's title because land is too expensive. Mm. Certainly people, squatters will not register until they have to, but they have to on sale. And I felt that that article was not supported by evidence. Mm. So I think this is the Pavlovsky and Brown article. There was also the Cobb and Fox the Cobb and article, Fox. which oh, suggested that, that. Well, they're on the yeah. same point. Yeah. The Cobb and Fox one argued that 
Scotters just won't use Schedule Six. They'll they'll sit quietly and they'll just live. Oh yeah, on the land. Absolutely. Absolutely. If you found that to be the case, I mean, well, why, you don't, why do we know? You would know. We don't know. But well, why would they register until yeah. they have to? Yeah. And and people register. <laughs> people try to register when it flares up, or if they want to sell. Yeah. But they register. They they apply for registration when somebody gets stroppy and says yeah. you shouldn't be on there. Mm. But otherwise, why would they? Because you don't want you don't want to provoke a dispute, <laughs> and the trouble is that an application for registration leads to dispute mm. if there's an objection. Mm. So, um, and, and litigation is bad for people. Shall we move on to priorities? Yes. Thank you. Right. I have less to say about priorities for the very good reason that I don't think we say terribly much about priorities in our report. Um, and perhaps what's more interesting than what we do say is, is really what we don't say. We do have a look at section 29 and we do discuss a couple of aspects of it. So we look at what postpone means. It's a, a controversial term. It was introduced in the 2002 Act. It was brand new language. It's had quite a lot of criticism, but I think we've reached a stage where people generally know what it means, and it captures the idea that if an interest is postponed through priorities, that doesn't necessarily mean it's lost forever. It is lost forever against the disponee and anyone who um, receives land under that disponee's title, but there may be other persons for whom that interest is still relevant. So, for example, the disposition is a grant of a lease an interest that loses priority, has lost priority forever against that lease and whoever owns that lease, and any interest granted under that lease, but is still relevant as far as the freehold title is concerned. So we discuss postpone and we discuss some of the concerns that have been raised with the term, but we conclude that there aren't really any issues there that, that merit law reform. Um, in particular, we didn't think that we should be replacing postponement with another word and generating the same case for all over again, uh, discussing what our new word meant. We then discuss valuable consideration because to benefit from the special priority rule under section 29, you need to have provided valuable consideration. It's only partially defined in the 2002 Act and that we're told that valuable consideration excludes nominal consideration in money and excludes marriage consideration. We thought it was a bit odd to exclude a nominal consideration in money but not other types of nominal consideration. So in fact, the one recommendation we make is to remove that limitation so that any nominal consideration could potentially be valuable consideration. But that doesn't mean that it is valuable, because you still have to meet the bar of saying the consideration is valuable. But what it means is that whether the particular consideration that's been provided on the facts is valuable can be considered by reference to the general law. And one of the key issues where this was referred to us is in relation to peppercorns. Because while it's, it seems a bit hard to believe, peppercorn consideration is still used quite regularly, we're told, in commercial transactions. And it's used to indicate that the transaction is a commercial one, not a gift. Well, if a peppercorn is nominal, and that's an if, it can still be valuable consideration under the 2002 Act, because only nominal consideration in money is excluded. But we didn't feel it was for us to say that a peppercorn is always valuable consideration. We thought that would go too far. And that says something about how we view the 2002 Act. We don't view the legislation as a code. We don't see it as the only thing that governs registered land. We see it as a piece of legislation that applies exclusively in its scope of operation but which sits on top of the general law and is informed by the general law. So we take the view that there's no reason to define valuable consideration in the Act because the general law will define what is and what isn't valuable consideration. So as far as Section 29 is concerned, we, we, we don't actually do terribly much. Our one recommendation really is around uh, removing 
uh, that bit of the definition of valuable consideration. The most significant thing we say about priorities, in fact, relates to unilateral notices, uh, the notices that you can put on the register uh, without the agreement of the land <coughs> registrar. And a particular issue was referred to us in relation to these, that when certain rights, including manorial rights, ceased to be overriding interests, there was a rush of applications to register those rights. And what that brought to light is a real asymmetry of information in the process at the moment. If somebody puts a unilateral notice on your land and you object to that, uh, to that entry, you can't require them to produce evidence of what right they have. They don't have to produce evidence until they're standing in front of Lizzie in the tribunal and Lizzie asks them or demands them to produce the evidence. We thought that was too far down the line in the process, and so we amend the procedure to ensure that if there's an objection to the entry of a unilateral notice, more evidence has to be provided to the land registrar at that stage in order to determine whether the entry should be made. Now, <clears throat> the final thing I say about that is that we did toy with the idea of whether we could have one system of notices, not two. So, so do we actually need read and unilateral notices? And probably the strongest reason for keeping the two types of notices is the desire for commercial confidentiality. That a unilateral notice is the only way to ensure that an interest is put on the register without commercially sensitive information being made publicly available. Now, our consultees were very strongly of the view that commercial confidentiality was significant here. But elsewhere in that registration, there has been more of a move to transparency. And so you might ask the question whether it's justified to have a scheme of notice entry which is just or which is based on the desire for confidentiality. Any responses? <clears throat> I used to work with a solicitor who liked to draft leases um, for a pre for, for a rent of one red rose if demanded annually. <laughs> I don't know if that counts as valuable consideration. I suppose peppercorns used to be valuable, didn't they? Yes, yes. <laughs> so now it might be, you know, half a Sainsbury's packet of saffron. <laughs> <laughs> I think that um, the manorial rights thing was a problem because people who had manorial rights and wanted to get them <coughs> registered would sort of splatter notices or applications to enter notices across large numbers of titles and it, it caused a lot of aggro. I think, am I right that that it has largely worked its way through the system? Yes. yes. Um, I, I am not really convinced that there is an information imbalance aside from that. Manorial rights were a special case and nobody really wants to talk about their manorial rights because they're a bit funny. But generally, you know, someone applies for a notice and, and gives some information in and somebody objects and then they exchange information to try and sort it out. Because nobody wants to come see me because litigation's bad for you. So people really try to actually swap information. Certainly, if they haven't done so before the reference to the tribunal, they certainly don't wait until they're in front of me because they have to exchange statements of case and basic documents straight away. So. I'm not sure about that, but I don't have strong views. No, I mean, I, 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 I think the use of priority is difficult, but what choice was there, really? I mean, it's, a, it's a better word than void. I think you can say that. And, and so I have a great deal of sympathy with, with the difficulties with that. I, I think I, I'm not convinced that we shouldn't have defined valuable consideration. But I think the priority rule is so central to the legislation except there's no evidence that it's a problem in practice. So, I not a, unless you know that there is. I mean, I don't know that there is. I, I suppose we probably have a particular view of evidence and that we rely on what consultees yeah, yeah. tell us. And we, we were told, for example, that, that there is quite significant concern around the meaning of, or around whether peppercorns would be accepted yeah. and valuable. But we've not had any litigation, of it, as far as I'm aware. We've had no, cases where no. people have said, 
there's been value in consideration and it's been a lie, but we've yeah. not really had anything. I mean, the, the one that bothers me about postpone most of all actually isn't the legislation, it's the land registry's response to it. I, I am very unhappy that the registry appears to be willing to put on the register by means of a notice rights which have clearly lost their priority through postponement. And I think that that is because the registry is less willing to engage in the management of the system than it was previously. So what situations do you have in mind? Well, let, let's say somebody applies to register a restrictive covenant that is perfectly valid but was created before disposition for value. So it's not binding on the current proprietor. Okay. I understand that the registry, I may be wrong, but I understand that the registry will put that on the register and then will write to the proprietor and say, do you object? I would much prefer them never to put it on the, on the register. But I haven't repeated notice, it doesn't go on. Well, so, I, I've been told by the, reg, the No, registry, okay, unilateral notice does unilateral go notice on. Unilateral notice does go and on. It, but the registrar doesn't know whether the purchaser was a bona fide purchaser no. for value without notice. Well, they don't have does to be it? without notice. They just need to be valuable consideration. They have to be without notice. Section 29 doesn't yeah, say... Yeah, but the, the, but the, the registrar not necessarily... I probably haven't understood yeah, I have not understood I, I am worried. Yeah. I'm I mean, just worried... I, I have little evidence. I don't like doing anything without little evidence. But I'm worried that the registry will put on the register things whose priority has been lost. And, and I think the land registry's concern is probably the, the risk of doing the opposite. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah the no, risk that, that they will not put something on the register because they take the view that priority has been lost. And it's subsequently found that priority hadn't hasn't. been lost because it wasn't a valuable consideration. Yeah. You see, my answer to that would be pay then because that's your job. And I can see that's well, not very attractive but, but to I the think, registry. Yeah, I, I think it goes further because I think in order to make that assessment under Section 29, mm -hmm. Lambert, it, it, it will be asking Lambert to speak to. To, to make an adjudication, yeah. to, to, to be yeah. a judge. And the notice doesn't um, guarantee the existence, the validity of the underlying interests. No, no, but that's not the issue. Isn't it? It's not its validity that's the issue, it's its priority. No one doubts that the covenant is there. Yeah. It's its priority. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I mean, what we're really arguing about, what I'm arguing about, is the role of the registry. Mm. I, I prefer a more active registry. Mm. And in the current climate, I mean, you're that's, gonna get a, I'm not going to get it. But, but, yeah. but I think where I'm... <coughs> struggling is to understand where that active registry crosses the line into being an adjudicative yeah, yeah, yeah. body, which I don't think it should be. I think I would need to have a concrete example mm. to know whether I agreed with you. And I'm not aware mm. of that happening. I, I, I need I misunderstood the example because I haven't really gotten the facts. The, the one order. situation that comes to mind that we do discuss in the report is where there is a form of overriding interest yeah. Yeah. Uh, and an application is made yeah. now to put that overriding interest yeah. on the register and, and there has already been a... Yeah, for this, yes. yeah. Mm. And I agree with what you'd recommend about that because the registry is too timid. Put them on, actually. There, yeah. there needs to be a reason for putting it on. Well, yeah. why, why does this still exist given there's been a disposition for yeah. value? Yeah. <coughs> May I just ask you a question? As as a judge, are you happy with value consideration not being defined? Because it's potentially giving you a sort of an open book to decide what it is on the merits of a particular case. Um, well, is it that difficult to decide if something's value? I can't imagine. I mean, I've never had to decide, but I can't imagine staying awake at night over it. Somebody pays ten pounds. Okay, it's worth ten pounds. That's okay. <laughs> <laughs> I, I'm not really. I'm not. It doesn't feel like a big puzzle. Okay. I may be wrong. Okay, what are you, you're now going to ramp down? <laughs> no, 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 it's not one penny. Um, it strikes me that in, in a world where section twenty eight and twenty nine are quite quite rigidly defined. Um, with, with a lot of certainty in sections 28 and 29, that is potentially one of the, the sort of safety valves which could, yeah. I think, be 
a conduit for some yeah. judicial I, discussion. I don't like <clears throat> over-definition. No. So I, I would rather um, leave the law a bit of room to breathe. Mm. Yeah, no, I can certainly see that. Um, I imagine that's part of the reason not to define yeah. it, let the general law breathe yes. within, the, yeah. within the provisions. Yeah. Yeah, because there is a fair amount of case law on the meaning of valuable consideration outside of mm. land legislation. I think part of our concern was that if we try and provide a definition for land registration, well, what are we doing? Are we codifying the case law generally? Are we coming up with a bespoke definition for land registration? Or what, what, what's, what, what's You, you make the a task? definition and someone will, find, will produce mm. a dodgy case. Mm. Before we move on, as we must, would anybody like to, to ask a question about priorities? So we'll move on. Move on. So we're now, <laughs> we're now going to talk about rectification. So one of the less contentious aspects of land registration. <laughs> um, I may say a little bit more about yeah, this, but I'll try yeah. not to say too much. Um, so we look at alteration and rectification. And one of the things I would encourage you to do is have a look at um, a publication that isn't part of our formal report but that we put online which is a track change version of the 2002 Land Registration Act that shows what our uh, recommendations or shows what our bill would do because our bill is an amending piece of legislation and have a look at what would happen to um, Schedule 4 uh, of the Act under our proposals. We had a number of um, aims in mind in our recommendations on rectification, and some of them were trying to resolve debates that have cropped up under the 2002 Act. So the first one um, is that we, we want to ensure that your ability to seek rectification of the register is not a property right. In other words, we want to put Mallory uh, to rest. Um, in fact, in our consultation paper, we were a bit more timid. We suggested its proprietary status doesn't matter as long as we say that it, it's not an overriding interest. In our report, we go further and say, no, it, it shouldn't be treated as a, a property right at all. We also want to put gold harp um, on a clearer statutory footing. So in other words, we want to enable the courts to be able to restore priority when the register is rectified in response, um, or when the register is rectified. So the other points on here I'm going to pick up in what I say. You should note at the outset, we only deal with correcting a mistake. We don't look at the other grounds on which the register may be altered. Um, so in essence, we're only looking at alterations that constitute rectification <laughs> in that very special meaning the 2002 Act has, um, that meaning which is linked to the ability to claim an indemnity. One of the points we have to consider is, should we define mistake? Um, because the legislation doesn't define it. Um, we did have some consultees write in and say that it's such a, a central concept it ought to be defined, but, but we took a different view. We thought that there is in fact an advantage in not saying what mistake is because that enables the concept to evolve and respond to different factual patterns. We think that what we're for moment per se pretty much captures um, what mistake means at the moment. Essentially it means the registrar has made an entry which the registrar wouldn't have done um, if the true state of affairs had been known. But what we do is clarify a couple of things that we think um, the legislation should ensure constitute mistakes. One of the most significant is that a scenario, I'm sure you're familiar with, the ABC scenario. So in our example, Ms. Green is the original registered proprietor of Spring Cottage. There is an identity fraud through which the cottage is transferred to Mr. Brown. There is then a legitimate sale by Mr. Brown to Miss Blue. Uh, and as you're aware, um, land lawyers will look at that and say, well, Mr. Brown's registration is clearly a mistake. But they have argued as to whether Miss Blue's registration is a mistake. 
and we've variously been told that rectification is available against Ms. Blue uh, because her registration is a mistake, because it's the consequence of the registration of Mr. Brown, uh, or that the registration of Mr. Brown and Ms. Blue are both part of one big mistake that's happened. In our consultation paper, we initially took the view that while the position of Miss Blue isn't necessarily clear in the legislation, the courts haven't hesitated at saying rectification is available. And so our provisional thought was that we didn't need to say anything about it in the legislation. We were corrected, not least by a consultation response from one Miss Goymore, um, who pointed out to us, quite rightly, that the position of Miss Blue was probably more precarious than we had suggested, not least because um, the case law, the strongest case law, is all at first instance level. And so we decided the legislation should actually clarify that the registration of Miss Blue is a mistake. You then start to work through the consequences of saying that that registration is a mistake. Because let's say that the registrar, when this dispute comes to light, decides that Miss Blue should remain on the register and Mr. Brown um, should be, or Miss Green should be compensated. That doesn't change the fact that Miss Blue's registration is a mistake. And it would mean, potentially, that every single registration that takes place after Miss Blue's registration is still a mistake. So in perpetuity, everything that now happens to this title is technically a mistake. But we thought that would not be a good position to leave things in. Um, so we suggest that once the decision has been made um, that Miss Blue stays on the register, we should wipe the slate clean. So then anything that Miss Blue does does not have to be treated as a mistake. One of the most significant things we suggest is introducing a long stop into the ability to obtain rectification. So we suggest that if a mistake has been on the register for 10 years, then generally, it should not be possible to change what the register says. We think there is a benefit in providing security in registration and in the ensuring that after a particular period of time, if you're on the register, you can feel safe in the knowledge that you're going to be able to stay on the register. It's not a limitation period, however, and importantly, the long stop doesn't affect the ability of somebody to obtain an indemnity. So in our example, if Miss Blue was on the register for 10 years and then the fraud came to light, what we're saying is that in most cases that means that Miss Blue can stay on the register, she doesn't have to be worried that she's going to lose her land, but anybody else who's lost out could still obtain an indemnity. So we're just helping make that decision as to who gets the land and who gets the money. Multiple registration you might have come across through Parshall and Hackney. Um, the example we have here is a fairly uh, simplified version of that case. <laughs> Let's say that the disputed um, area is part of Blackacre and is registered uh, under Blackacre's title, but then by mistake it's entered under Whiteacre's title as well. So we have a case of, of double registration. We think that these cases should be resolved under Schedule 4, not through adverse possession. Um, so we think Parshall and Hackney is correct uh, in that respect. But we were worried that the legislation may not really accommodate the outcomes in these cases, because if Whiteacre has now been happily using this space for, say, 50 years, and then the uh, error comes to light, the legislation would seem to point towards restoring the land to Blackacre. 
And that's because the registration on the black paper in the first place wasn't a mistake. So there doesn't seem to be a ground for removing it from the black paper's title. So we suggest that cases of multiple registration should simply be seen as cases in which there is a mistake. So again, clarifying uh, what constitutes a mistake. That means the courts can look at what should be the right <coughs> in these cases, applying the general scheme uh, that we give in Schedule 4. And that is all I'm going to say, the whistle-stop tour of indemnity of uh, rectification. I'm sure there's a lot that you'd like to respond to. Do you want to hear from Um How long have you got? Um, <laughs> I, 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 I have to say... But, and Nick knows I think this, I think this is a wholly pointless waste of time, reforming this, because I think it's built on a, a fundamental misunderstanding of how this works. I, I, I agree with taking out the right to rectify as a property right. Yep. I mean, I think it's, Fantastic. you know, yeah. no sane person can think right. it's a property right. Um, well, with a great respect person. to <laughs> Lady, with a great respect to now Lady Arden, um, I mean, I, you're dead right. I mean, that, that's unarguable. But, but I think this reform is built on a conceptual view of rectification, not a real world view. Because the, the, I'm trying to avoid the word mistake. For me, for me, the misunderstanding is to think that a mistake means the register should be changed. Because the legislation doesn't say that. The legislation says that when the proprietor is in possession, the register should not be changed unless one of three things are met. So the fact that, that Miss Blue is 20 years down the line, if she's in possession, the register's not going to be changed. She's not in danger. So removing the idea that it's a mistake is just tidying the books on the bookshelf. And in those one or two cases where you might want to do it, why would you want to stop it? In those one or two cases, which we've never had, which we've never had, where it's unjust, because for some extraordinary reason, okay, give her, why would you want not to? Why would you not to? So I, I just don't think this adds anything to where we are now. And, and I'm, a, I'm sorry to say that, but I, and I think the long, the long stop is a paranoid view about certainty of the register. That, that is ridiculous. Sorry. I just think it's pointless. I genuinely think it's pointless. <laughs> the, whole, the whole reform of this, of this so schedule. So do you disagree with the direction of travel or just the necessity to have the well, what, change? What, but, but that's is the that... point. What is the direction of travel? What is the direction of travel? Because the original Schedule 6 has a direction of travel. Well, what is the direction of travel? I think the direction of travel is towards greater security in registration. If there's a, a direction that cuts across what the 2002 Act says and what we're doing, it's probably doing exactly what you don't want to do, which is it's placing more emphasis on registration. Um, and that's the direction that goes back from you know, 1925 onwards. Um, and I think... <laughs> The other thing I say is that we don't invent these things and then put them down and not no, ask anyone about it. Mm. Um, and we did have a lot of, no, we, we had mixed re review or mixed responses um, to our proposals around the long stop, but we did have a lot of support for it. And I think to some extent, it, there are situations where we haven't done things because there wasn't, there wasn't evidence of a problem. There are other situations where we we have done things despite the fact we don't have cases showing that problems are coming up because we took the view that those the possibility of those problems arising is not theoretical but they are real problems in a registration system but I, I, I haven't done a fully extensive survey but i haven't yet found a case in 120 odd years of land registration where somebody's applied to change the register after 10 years i, I haven't found one and, and I don't think you're going to find one. And I, I, therefore, I think this is, this is solving a problem that doesn't exist in order to say the register is more secure. 
but I think where I would question you is in only looking at the current case law as your sole source of evidence. Well, I'm looking at 125 years worth of case law. Yeah. I'm not looking yeah. at, you know, I mean, that's pretty significant, I would say. Um. <laughs> Hang on. Okay, series of points. One is the the uh, recommendation of ensuring the right to rectify yeah. is not a proprietary right is obviously fantastic. Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> Point two, making sure that Miss Blue, so A, B, C, gets an indemnity. That's the problem at the moment. Yeah. If she's not a mistake, yes. she doesn't yeah. get an indemnity. That's absolutely right. It took me a long time to come to that. Point three, I think thought, as I looked at it again today, I started getting sort of trouble in my soul, but Miss Blue is safe where she's in possession. Yes. I thought the problem with the, 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 the long stop was trying to meet is where Miss Blue is not in possession. Yes. Yeah. 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 In which case, at the moment, she doesn't have mm. security. Um, so where you've got a position where A is not in possession and C is not in yeah. possession, yeah. which is perfectly possible. Um, I think the long stop is quite useful. Yeah. Um, it, uh, the, but just qualifying that slightly, sorry, in that mm. blue is almost safe as she's in possession, but there is the exceptional circumstances yeah. get okay, out. Okay, and that's that, thank yeah, you for reminding me of that. Um, now, I, yes, that exceptional circumstances does, does bother me. Just to jump off the tangent. So this is the unjust not to rectify. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah okay. Yeah. Um, I have changed my mind about Miss Blue since becoming judge. So, learning about registration, particularly talking to people who are experts with the torrent system, where dynamic security has always been a much heavier emphasis than the static security that our system has favoured until 2002. So until 2002, if the current... Sorry, this is too long, this is no. too long a sentence. <laughs> no, until no, no. 2002, if the register didn't match the position that it would have been in unregistered land, then it was wrong and it had to be rectified, the old Section 83 of 1925. Um, so we were very much into dynamic security. And then the picture changed. 2002 says the new proprietor in possession um, really ought to be staying there. And... The courts have had enormous difficulty taking that in the way it was intended. And once I became a judge, I understood why. Because emotionally, it is heaps harder to deprive something, somebody of property that they bought and have lost than it is to deprive someone who's only just had it and wants to keep it. So, Intellectually, C is much stronger and more attractive than A because we want to keep land in commerce, we want to keep land moving around, and the indemnity is fine. But emotionally, A trumps C almost every time. Not for because, me, and this is no, probably my because, problem. <laughs> no, it didn't for me. It didn't for me until I started having to do it. Mm. And then the old, the old judge finds that actually this is really... Um, counterintuitive and, and doesn't match for me the emotional reality on the ground of Mr. A in our ABC saying, Look, it was mine. How could it now be his? So, and I have to say, just sort of going back to our land law lectures, which we don't want to remember, but th this group, or much of this group, <coughs> when <coughs> Asked to consider the ABC scenario did largely Do you want A? go for A. Of course, everyone does. Yeah. Yeah. Now, everyone does. Well, Lord, <laughs> whether I find that emotionally, <laughs> well, <you don't. laughs> whether I find this emotionally difficult or not, does not matter. Um, what does matter is that the statute didn't have the intended effect, mm. and that's why the case law has become difficult here. Mm. So, if it is still because legal policy is not for me to say. I, I am the, the, the humble journeyman who will implement whatever's there and will deal with the law that's in front of me. But if the law wants to ensure that Miss Blue keeps the land, it's got to say so loud and clear 
in a way that is beyond the wrigglings mm -hmm. of the mm -hmm. likes of me. So if you want to reinforce Miss Blue's security, by all, by all means do, but mm. that, I suppose I'm just revealing the emotional problem but, that the law runs up against. But that's the, the, the noticeable in that because you've reached that decision, um, or you've reached that position, you agree with the long stop, I think, yes. what you yeah, said. Yeah, I'm right with the long stop. Martin, I just don't think it's the other. Oh, but you, that, that was the other thing I was going to say. The other thing I was going to say was, you're saying you look back over 125 years, but if you look back over 125 years, there's pretty much no rectification cases under the 1925 mm -hmm. Act because people weren't doing the fraud that they're doing now. Mm -hmm. and, and therefore, you won't get these long stop cases mm -hmm. yet. And so the idea of you know, getting yeah. rid of the carry forward mistake on the time that's I think that means say. I think it means, and, and we'd all be saying the silly, silly old law commission for not thinking about yeah. the long stop. Yeah, I, if I we didn't, didn't have to do that. <laughs> 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 Which was Apart from Martin. <laughs> <laughs> Can I say what Nick and I were smiling about when you were talking? We went to Auckland to a conference on the Torrent system. Oh, I wanted to go to that. And, and I think so what, to if to I, <laughs> correct me if I'm wrong, but I think what we learned was the Torrent system isn't. It, it, it isn't this wonderful nirvana of safety in your title because they have as many excuses. They just call them different things. Yes, absolutely. It's a lie. Yeah. The Torrent is a lie. I went I'm not going to, to go the, that far. I went, I, went, I went to the first incarnation of that conference yeah. in 2002, I think, and I still got post on it on my wall because it's changed although, my life. If I may say, although I am always hard on, on law reform, our Land Registration Act is a fantastic success. Yeah. And we are arguing, we are nibbling yeah. about detail. And what the Torrance Law is envy we is are the nibbling. priority we give to yeah. possession. Yeah. We are they nibbling. Don't yeah. Yeah. Was, can I ask you, Nick, when, mm. when thinking about this ABC dispute, in the, in the consultation papers you said you sort of pretty much assumed the cases had gone to A, yes. giving A a chance yeah. to rectify yeah. the Did you revisit the whole question about whether we should be actually giving greater security to C, with tighten up the legislation, give them that, give, leave no wiggle room at all? I, I think to some extent we, we tried to do a couple of things. We we tried to improve the position of a successors in title yes. because we think that the legislation at the moment is generous towards a but not so generous yeah. towards yeah. successors. Yeah. I think beyond that, we weren't trying to push towards them. Mm. Um, what we were trying to do is ensure that the legislation sets down the principles that should be used to decide cases while giving judges enough wiggle room to decide on the facts. We're probably you doing give us wiggle doesn't room. Wiggle. No, it's fine. Wiggle. I enjoy wiggling. Wiggle. <laughs> Not a problem to me. Um, yeah, so I don't that's think we the direction really push of wiggle. <laughs> um, I think we should open this up to questions because I'm sure there are some questions on rectification. Anybody want to? Yeah. Um, I was just wondering, you give the example of where you avoid I, I Mr. Not say, I'm, not <laughs> I'm not saying anything. <laughs> voidable no. disposition is not a mistake. Registration yeah. of a voidable yeah. disposition is yeah. not a mistake. Yeah. And some people agree with that, and some people don't. <laughs> I think the problem is the word mistake, actually, yes. because clearly a voidable disposition is not a mistake, but it's still wrong. <laughs> because no, it's we weren't going to it's suggest the legislation says wrong. Yes, it might not be avoided, but when it is avoided, like that's when it is avoided, then surely it's an error that can be corrected and rectified and compensated for. But that's, that's, that's how you update the register. The register was correct yeah. when registered, yeah, but, you don't get but any then money. you yeah, no, you don't. No, and I think that's wrong. But why should why should somebody subject to a rescindable disposition? Get any money because they're largely going to be implicated in the fraud in the first place. Not necessarily. I think in order for a decision to work against them. Reason. They're not necessarily implicated in it. I mean, my big problem with it, we don't agree what's void and what's voidable. English law doesn't agree what's void and what's voidable. So it's great to have that distinction, but we can't agree. 
So is is undue influence a void or avoidable transaction? Avoidable. Avoidable? Avoidable. So we agree. We agree. <laughs> <laughs> what about where are void? What where about the A B C scenario where it's voidable? A, a to B is voidable. I don't know why I'm pointing at the yeah. website. <laughs> um, it's not there. Yeah. But A remains an actual application. Is there an argument that the right to rescind the deed is proprietary? No. 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 I hope it's not. not. <laughs> I hope not. But that's, no. is it something no. you've worried about? <laughs> not until now. Oh, okay. <laughs> <laughs> I might worry about it now. Let's <laughs> say it's not proprietary. It's not proprietary. It's not proprietary. It's not proprietary. You're always a new source of the deed. <laughs> that's not the point, isn't it? No. Any other questions? Yeah. I just want to know, um, in your um, experience as a judge, what kind of proprietor, uh, proprietor is A? Because I don't understand why it's more emotionally difficult mm. to protect A than C, who's actually in possession of the land and it's their home. To me, the only case in which C could be in possession of a home is when A owns many homes, or it's just another home for them, or something like that. So I don't understand why it's emotionally more difficult to give protection to C over A. Well, both A and C come in all shapes and sizes. There may be many reasons why, why A is not at home. A may be an absentee landlord for whom we don't have a lot of sympathy. Or A may be a little old lady who's gone into residential care. Um, or A may be in prison or A may have left for some good reason that the inter yeah, I'm, I'm making things up, obviously. Um, but equally, C, gen C is going to come in all shapes and sizes. C, likewise, may be about to become an absentee landlord, it may be by to let. These frauds are easiest to perpetrate in rented property that is not the freeholder's home. So very often neither A nor C had the slippers by the fireside, the whiskey <laughs> on the mantelpiece, and the children at the local school. Um, the fraud tends to come to light relatively shortly after. So C moves in or doesn't move in, gets the builders in, and then A rolls up in the car and says, good Lord, what are you doing there? So it's relatively unusual for C to have moved in and set up home and got the slippers by the fireside and moved to get the mouthpiece. So I think my rather rambling answer to your question <laughs> is, actually, it's not really about A is always like this and C is always like this. They're always different. But underlying that is the it was his and he's had it taken away. Yeah, you see, that doesn't That's bother the me. Hard bit. I mean, I don't <laughs> that. I mean oh, they're going to get cash, right? They're going to get cash. They may not want cash. Oddly enough, people really mind that. Yeah, of, of course they do, right? Of course they do. But what about C, who's also paid cash? And they really like this ancient farmhouse that they bought, that they've been looking for for 20 years. Yeah. And so there's Civic something, you, you see, there's something special about that. I think that that changing six is really clever because it focuses so on a con sorry, four, that, 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 that we, we understand, and that's possession. Yeah. No, that's, that's and it true. links ownership back to possession. And I don't think the way possession is a, doesn't. Yes, and I don't think, <laughs> yes, I don't think it's random. Right. That it's possession. Mm. But it takes quite a broad interpretation of possession. And I think that argument that possession is important reflects a narrower understanding of what possession means. That you could be in possession under Schedule 4 if your tenant is there and you've never actually mm -hmm. walked through the front door yourself. Mm. Mm. <laughs> yeah. Is that the sort of possession? Because when I think of um, they're feeling more sympathetic to people who are in possession, it got to feel sympathetic for them if they had moved in for a week and you know, their kids had just started in the local school. The new <laughs> bottle of whiskey is open on the mantelpiece yeah, but, and the but it doesn't slippers say, are in their box. It doesn't say occupation, it says possession. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. But you're not removing the defence no, no, available no, to the no, no, possession. No, so no but, but it's the argument of why should you feel sorry for A? Mm -hmm. 
I mean, but, well, I, I just think it's so fact dependent. A may be an idiot. It is. It is fact. Who has left? Who has just... I'm not. Yeah, I'm not saying we always like A better than C. But at least give A a chance I'm to have that, a claim against yeah, C. Yeah, I'm, I'm saying that there are cases where it's really yeah. hard to deprive A. I'm not yeah. saying it's invariable, but I'm just saying that actually the emotional tug turns out to be much stronger than I had expected. Mm -hmm. We've gone over I'm the sure hour, but does anybody have any other questions on rectification? I think we are going to go over a little bit just yeah. to discuss indemnity, if that's okay. But are there any other questions on rectification? No? Oh, no. Indemnity. indemnity. So we'll pass over to Nick for our final so thing, indemnity. Yes. And indemnity, um, I think, is, is something that sometimes <laughs> overlooked yeah. as a topic, and I, I describe it elsewhere as the ugly sister to rectification Cinderella, oh. uh, because oh. we talk oh. a lot, oh. Um, oh. <laughs> sibling. So it's fine. Mm. Sibling. we talk a lot about rectification, as we just have, yeah. we disagree <laughs> fiercely about rectification, we don't think very much about indemnity a lot of the time. We take it for granted that the land registration system says if you lose out, then you get an indemnity. Um, but what I think we need to bear in mind is that the scope of the indemnity scheme we have is not inherent. It reflects policy decisions that have been made about the nature of the registered title that a person has. And it's something that operates quite magically in land registration because at the point of registration all of the risks of that transfer, so all of the risks that, that the transfer uh, to Mr Brown uh, was a void transfer, pass from Mr Brown to the registrar and the indemnity buys. And in fact as a purchaser where you're most vulnerable is in that pre-registration stage and the most danger you have is that land registry are clever and pick up on the fact that a fraud has taken place which your solicitor hadn't identified uh, because then they won't register you and the risk of that fraud you find lies only with you. When we had our consultation paper, uh, we didn't put forward provisional proposals to be form indemnity. We asked a series of, of open questions about the nature of the indemnity scheme we should have. Um, and what came back from our consultation responses is that there was an appetite to look at the duties that lenders and conveyancers are under, and there's an appetite to look at how rigorous identity checks are, but there was no appetite to move away from that. And in particular, what people said to us is that they were happy with the idea of a duty of care being imposed, but only if two conditions were met. The first, quite reasonably, is that those who were subject to the duty understand exactly what's expected of them to comply with it. And the second, perhaps more tellingly, is that no duty of care should interfere with the ability of the individual who has lost out to obtain an indemnity from land registry. So no duty of care of as broad a nature as exists in a number of other jurisdictions, including Scotland, for example. So what we came up with in the end is adding to the existing rights of recourse that the land registry has. So that if it has paid out an indemnity, it should be able to bring an action against a conveyancer uh, if that conveyancer has not followed steps to verify a person's identity that land registry will set down in directions. So we've ended up expanding land registry's rights of recourse. But I think when you stand back and think about where, where the consequences of fraud are going to lie, there aren't many choices, there's only three. There's the consumer, uh, and I think most people instinctively would say that the individual shouldn't lose out, although you know, there is that risk if land registry spots the fraud before registration. There's the conveyancer, and I think the 
conveyancers would quite reasonably say they shouldn't bear uh, the, the, the loss unless they have failed to maintain professional standards. So you're only really left with land registry. Well, I, I mean, I, I agree with Nick. I think indemnity is the key function of our title guarantee system, and, and without it, this wouldn't work. And I think it, it's what gives confidence, and it's what gives value, and it creates moral hazard. So I'm all in favour of increasing rights of recourse. I'm glad there's no indemnity cap, because yeah. all that would have happened, mm. remember, was it Alberta? Was it Alberta? Title insurance. Uh, where the, the land registrar of Alberta proudly, and it is Alberta, oh, yes. is it Ontario yeah. or Alberta? Uh, um, Ontario. Ontario, yeah. Ontario. Uh, Ontario proudly announced that they paid half a million Canadian dollars mm. in indemnity, which just told Professor Hopkins and I that their system wasn't Doesn't working. Work. Yeah. <laughs> because what happens is all the parties got title insurance instead, went to private insurance companies. So I'm a big fan of indemnity. I think these proposals are absolutely spot on. Yeah, I agree. The, um, there is a public perception that land registration is about the gathering of information mm. and that the land registry is an information service. It's not. Yeah. It's a guarantee. Service, yeah. um, the capping indemnity would be a very bad move because it would simply put an awful lot of money into the coffers of the title insurers, yeah. and that would be yeah. a great shame. Yeah. Yeah. So yes, I'm I'm very happy with those. What's a happy note on which oh, to end? Nice. <laughs> Concurrence among the panel. Would anybody like to? Um, no, don't spoil it. Yeah, don't, <laughs> don't ruffle the feathers of this. Don't ask any questions. <laughs> I think not. So, should we draw it to a close? Are you happy with that? Yeah. So, thank you very much to our panelists thank for coming you. to Cambridge. Thank you for having us. And thank you everybody for coming as well. Thank you.